Uh, so welcome to Decoding Trust in Confidential Computing Foundations and Open Source Perspectives. If this is not what you thought it was, you're in the wrong place, but you're staying anyway. So uh, thank you. Anyhow, uh, I am Mike Bessel. Hi. I am the uh, Executive Director of the Confidential Cons Computing Consortium, and this is... I'm not sure your um, your. There we go. Is. It's on now. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sal Kimmick, TCA Technical Community uh, Coordinator, basically for the CCC. Uh, and today, the thing that we really want to parse apart here is why it is that we use this specific definition, what this means on a technical level, and why this technical definition is so important to have embedded in the conversation around open source. So we want to explain to you today what it really means when we say that confidential computing is the protection of data in use by performing computation in a hardware-based, attested, trusted execution environment. So let's step through what that means. I should say that this definition, simple as it look, took six months for our technical advisory committee to, to agree on. It's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I hope that everyone in here cares at least about one of these things. We've got software supply chain, key management, cloud computing, software correctness, AI provenance, data privacy, hardware supply chain, identity authorization, authentication, cryptographic primitives, all of those things. And I really hope that you, know, you care about at least one, hopefully multiple of these, or you kind of probably wouldn't be here. So the question we're trying to ask is, who do I trust? in relation to each of those things. Um, specifically as well, to do what? Because a trust, to say you trust someone, means you trust them to do a particular thing, or you trust an entity to do a particular thing in a particular way. If you're interested, read the book. Uh, that's my only pitch for now. Uh, and so we'll, we, we're going to be looking at what some of this stuff means. And th the two words we're going to pull out first are hardware-based and attested in that definition. So let's start off with this. Here we got a picture um, with a, a system, which is the kind of the big box. And in it, there are three things. There's uh, two workloads, and we've got a host operating system. And they're in separate boxes, right? And so I want to talk about three different types of isolation. The first one is isolating two workloads from each other, or more than the workloads from each other. And VMs and containers know how to do this, right? They can stop uh, workloads interfering with each other. The second is host from workload isolation. Uh, and that is uh, stopping your workload interfering with your host, because you really don't want that happening, because if they can do that, then they can break out and do all sorts of bad things, right? And again. VMs, hypervisors, containers know how to do this pretty well, right? Isolating, keeping your host safe from the workloads is pretty easy. The big difficult one, and the one we're going to be talking about here, is isolating your workload from your host. So stopping the host interfering with your workload. Why would you care? Well, you have sensitive data. You put it in the cloud. What is to stop the host the CSP, anyone has compromised that machine from interfering with your data and your application? The answer is nothing. On a technical point of view, nothing. They may you know, have agreed to some uh, legal bits and pieces, but that's just legal bits and pieces. From a technical point of view, from a regulator's point of view, there's nothing to stop them. Virtualization doesn't provide any ways of doing that. And what... Uh, trusted execution environments do, they, are, they provide chip level isolation. Intel chips have them, AMD chips have them, ARM chips about to come in, NVIDIA have versions of this, um, at RISC-V also, um, to provide that isolation, to give you ways to show that uh, and to make sure that um, your host or anyone who has hypervisor access, kernel access, admin access, can't interfere with the, uh, the workload. And that's what uh, the hardware-based bit means, because it's provided at the chip level. But we have a problem. Because how can you be sure that 
this T, this trusted execution environment that we just talked about, is actually doing it right? How can we be sure that it's using valid hardware, that's been correctly set up, the software that you're actually running is what you think you should be running. And here's a nice little thing to have as well, that each TE has a separate identity. If you think of a TE as a workload, sort of container level granularity, you want to know that each is protected and that each is unique. And it's all very well for me to say to the hardware, please set one of these up. And the hardware will say, of course I've done that. But if I don't trust the hardware in the first place, blah, how does this work? So this brings us on to the next word, which is attested. Sal, take it away. So confidential computing solves a pretty serious problem that I have come into all across my career. I have worked in computation for over a decade. And I've done that in spaces where we've been working with relatively sensitive data. So think Missile Defense Agency, US Air Force, and National Institutes of Health. I think the first condition where I came concerned about the solution environment was at NIH when I read a uh, paper from the National Institutes of Cancer Research, and they were concerned about releasing a data set because you were able to re-identify the individuals based by a nearby breach of Netflix accounts because you were much more likely at a research medical center to have surrounding participants from the area. I think there is a lot of conditions where we are going to be doing compute on things that we did not traditionally see as sensitive or privacy breaching. We're going to see a lot more conditions like that. Right now, this is limited to those sensitive workloads. But I want to make sure that if I'm going to have something which has sensitive data, or more so now if you're running on an AI workload, a sensitive algorithm, those are the things that we are threat modeling for now. And it looks very different from traditional systems. So in this case, I do not want to execute. I do not want to have a runtime unless I am able to attest to the following conditions. First, I need to make sure that it's running on valid hardware. Is this where I want it to run, or is there a possibility that it's been uh, that it's pointing me somewhere where anyone else can get to the operating system? Number two, is the TE correctly set up? This is an issue that is as old as reproducible builds are anywhere else. You want to do these correctly. Otherwise, it's going to make it look like you have something compromised when really you've just put timestamps into your system. Third, uh, you want to make sure that the software in the TEE is what you expect. Is this my runtime on my hardware running only when I want it to and only given back to me, fully encrypted both in and out? So the attestation process. We will have a TEE within it. We have put our application, and we're sitting on either a CPU or a GPU. I'm going to measure and attest. I'm going to ensure that I'm on the hardware that I want to be on. Then I'm going to cryptographically measure this and bring it back to myself as the user, meaning that I'm not going to have the possibility of compromising either data or algorithm or spend a cent of money compromising that data or algorithm. That, for me, is really the game-changing thing here that you have to consider. So let's see what... Go let's ahead. just go back one. as something I was going to add here, which is the attestation service. That has got to be a third party. It's got to be owned by someone else to the, whoever's providing your, um, uh, your com compute, right? So let's say, uh, to pick literally at random, because uh, I know a number of people from there, uh, Microsoft Azure, right? So they have confidential computing uh, capabilities. What we'd prefer is that they're not the ones attesting this is correct, right? Otherwise, it's like marking your own homework. So that's kind of where we want to be going, so that these are third-party um, uh, services. Exactly how the business models work for that are interesting is something we're looking into in the CCC, uh, which is the Confidential Computer Consortium, as we speak. So this is a kind of a scary big, big picture, and I'm going to walk you through it. First of all, as with any type of security, we need to think about roots of trust, sometimes called trust anchors. And in this case, we have three main roots of trust. We have the hardware, the chip that's actually going to be doing what it should be doing, hopefully, the firmware that allows that to happen, and the software that's going to be executing within that trusted execution environment. Those are the three roots of trust that we want to come back to. And there's some 
properties that we want to derive as a process of using the TE. The first one is the integrity of what we're running, and the second is the confidentiality of the thing that we're running. We want to get to those. And how do we get to those? That is the, the question that we want to be looking at. How can we actually trust that those have been correctly delivered? Well, before we go there, there's a couple of other things that we'd like to be able to derive as well if we can. One is identity. It would be great if each of these TEOs had a separate identity and also that that identity is unique because you don't want things spoofing, right? So, these are four useful properties that we want to be able to derive. And we have some primitives to allow us to get from one to the other. The hardware, the software, and the firmware are put together into this hardware-based TE. And that is where we're going to be going to get the other pieces. But there's some missing bits. Because we need to decide... Oh. That'd be me. Uh, how we uh, how we trust those roots of trust, and the answer is we have endorsers. So endorsing authorities, when it comes down to it, there's got to be an actual thing or organisation or set of things or people who you can trust, who you come back to and say, you know, this is this is where I I can derive that trust, and we call those endorsers or endorsing authorities. So the silicon vendor is going to be the endorsing uh, authority for your hardware, right? AMD put chips, make chips, and inside those there are uh, cryptographic keys. Same for Intel, um, uh, for ARM's licensees, NVIDIA, people like that. Firmware vendor. Now, typically, that'll be the same as the hardware the silicon vendor, but it may be different. And, of course, for the software, it's your software vendor or the OSS community. And this is where it's going to start getting interesting shortly, folks. But even if we have all of these, we still have that missing attestation piece that we talked about earlier on. And for that, we need an attester. That's the person running that uh, attestation service. And they perform the remote attestation. And that is our second primitive that allows us to derive all the other bits and pieces. So because we have isolation and verification, we can derive integrity, confidentiality, identity, and uniqueness for each of our workloads. If you start thinking about computing and security with these primitives as just given, it changes the way you think about how you architect your systems. It takes a while, but once you get it, it just changes how you think about all of this stuff. Um, so. I'm going to hand over to Sal again, I think. There we go. So I think this is interesting. We're trying to make a choice about who are the correct entities, and it has to be a set of entities, most likely, that need to be our endorsers. But let's think about the way that open source looks right now. So whoop, let's jump back quick. This is not the first slide, is it? Uh, so, if we make the endorsers, in this case, the open source community, I think there's a lot of really valuable reasons for that. We're in a room right now in which a lot of the technology has been produced from antitrust principles because that allows us to have a sort of both the Darwinian concept of what is the best path forward technologically and interoperably, but also in this case, we need to be able to ensure that when I am trying to attest my software that it is either a, a strong decentralized authority or a strong centralized authority of trust. But I think we're in a situation right now where I honestly don't want to be running a compute load unless I have a third party verifier. And that's really what we're arguing for here. Uh, again, do you want to take this part okay. of the TE? <laughs> Sorry. So the, the point we're trying to make here is that although typically we think of OSS community as being the, the endorsers for software, we all know that that's changing. We have a firmware um, capabilities coming through uh, LF foundations. We have hardware coming through that as well. So there are absolutely cases where the OSS community is not just creating and endorsing 
the, uh, the software in this picture. It's also uh, creating and therefore endorsing the hardware and the firmware too. And question, should the community be running attestation services? Who better to do it is one way of looking at it. Um, it's tricky. We, again, discussing these things. So you want to take over this bit? This is the part that I'll take over. Sorry. Uh, so uh, we tend to think about trust chains and uh, some of the presentations that we've seen so far genuinely think about trust chains in this way, right? Who are our central uh, points of trust in this? And what is the transitive train within that? Although you don't have to be much of an engineer to understand that you need a single one of these chains to break in order for the system to not work. Um, in open source, our communities are incredibly complex, not just because the intellectual property comes from different places, but because that is strategically the best way to, de uh, defend, to defend and develop. So a lot of our open source communities do look like this, right? We have strong and weak transitive relationships between the individuals and the packages that we consume. This, again, uh, given recent events, we do not want to forget that the reason why we are able to pick up cybersecurity events is because of the amount of eyes that we have on the lines of code at this time. This is healthier than a simple trust chain. It also does mean that very practically, the way that we are building our dependencies often has the consequences of the systems that we rely on. Right now, it's very challenging for us to consume a completely hygienic set of software materials. And we have to be very careful about checking the dependencies that are secondary and tertiary within those. I want to make that point here because I think that what we're talking about here is very different from supply chain's idea, perhaps, of attestation and trust. And I think that we need to be clear about this language. Um, and these are the two points where these converge. What we're arguing for is a very good way to handle sensitive data and sensitive algorithms, and this is for very, very specific environments. Again, I think one of the best environment, one of the best examples for this is uh, the use of confidential computing to hold on to images of human trafficking victims in OSINT or in any of these policing disciplines, you cannot hold on to that data. We can now do confidential computing and extract information about those while never re-identifying those individuals. That's incredibly valuable. But it's a computing security solution. You still have to do all of the standard practices of supply chain. Be very sure that what you are consuming into your TEE has all of the principles of very good open source consumption. Do they actively engage in bug and feature management? Do they have clear and responsive vulnerability reporting, which you can check very easily by very simply sending an email to say, hi, do you respond to these emails? It's very easy. Uh, number th three, this is more important now, demonstrate a provenance of maintainers and contributors by vendor or institute whenever possible. And I do want to come back to this just one more time. Also be careful to look at the hygiene of consumption from the open source uh, projects that you're consuming. This can be really easy actually quantita quantitatively measured by their mean time to update. So do they consume themselves products that have very good security and regularly release, right? All of that are still things that you need to do. You still have to pay attention to reproducible build practices. But as soon as you do that, this creates a condition where you can do really sensitive compute and, condition, and uh, spaces that we were never able to before. But let's take one step back to trust in open source. Are you taking over? <laughs> so we've thrown a lot of stuff at you, and I apologize for that. Uh, the problem is to get to the conversation we want to have we need to explain, explain all the bits and pieces before. So just briefly to, to go back over this, where we want to be is on the right of this picture. We want some derivable properties, integrity, confidentiality, identity, and uniqueness. But to get there, we are going to need some endorsing authorities, some endorsers, to allow us to build a chain of trust across to those and build the trust relationships with our actual computing primitives. And what we are trying to uh, propose here is that not only 
uh, is the... Uh, is the open source community already involved, but it absolutely must be involved. However, for businesses consuming these sorts of things, this becomes complex. Now, it's complex already, but we have to be clear about the complexities when we're consuming these types of primitives. Because endorsers aren't just monolithic in, uh, authorities, and that's particularly the case in community. So let's say we want to say that we trust this package from this community. What does that actually mean? How can we do that? So the typical ways that we've, we've done that are by things like commercial implementations or commercial distros. So you could have Red Hat, for instance. I used to work for Red Hat, so the example I, I give, um, you know, stands behind a particular distro, or a, uh, a particular company, a startup stands behind a particular implementation of a particular um, uh, confidential computing uh, application or framework, for instance. So we kind of know how to do that. And there's a, uh, uh, a, a single authority we can point at and say, that is the endorsing authority. Another way of doing this is via open source foundations. Um, such as the Linux Foundation or Clips Foundation or particular projects within that. Um, there are legal ways of guaranteeing or assuring that we know what we're talking about and who to go to. I think we're also going to be seeing more decentralized organizations. Uh, blockchain has changed the way we think about these things. Um, SSI, self-sovereign identity, is changing how we think about uh, where we point at and what is an uh, endorsing authority. I don't know where this is going, but we certainly need to think about it. Um, but let's go back to the foundation. So the Confidential Computing Consortium is a foundation, and although it doesn't provide endorsing authority at the moment, something we might think about, if you're interested in uh, confidential computing, uh, and if you're in this room, I kind of assume you are, then I would hope that your organization or you um, would be interested in being part of or indulging in uh, conversations as part of the uh, Confidential Computing Consortium. We know that foundations build confidence in terms of uh, business regulated standards bodies, but also they can help with technical maturity of uh, solutions and, of course, encourage the open source community. Um, do you want to talk about this for a bit? So at the Confidential Computing Consortium, we have a bit 12 as of this week, at least as of this month, <laughs> 12 projects as of this month. Uh, there's uh, frameworks. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit to look into. And we've got, if you go to the CCC website, we have all of our recent webinars up. And we uh, by weekly or every other uh, week, have uh, tax sessions where we often bring those projects in. Uh, so there's recordings of them. We focus on standards. I think this is really interesting. Um, the CC kind of fits in an emerging technology space. So if you are interested or impacted by government and regulation and policies, I think this is an interesting space where we're developing, uh, we're working on RFIs and we're developing patterns. Um, our technical work is really interesting in this space. Particularly right now, we just started a kernel SIG where we are focusing on trying to develop a standardized ABI, particularly around secure primitives. If that speaks to you at all, absolutely join in the mailing list for that because there is a lot of interesting work done there. Academic research, this is a space where uh, we have a couple of really good PhD students that are working on pushing the edge of, uh, of how we consume these and also working on things like how we uh, speed up things like SQL once you get it in the system. Um, and I think that here's the core point. Um, CC is complex, it's hardware and software and understanding a full stack of computation here. And we are trying to work on a definition of trust that can be measured. Genuinely, those conversations have to be done in the antitrust and we have to find solutions that everyone can agree on. Um, if you have more questions, uh, both Mike and particularly myself are the ones to come to. I can tell you more about 
our technical community and any ways in which you would like to get involved. I think uh, we've covered some of these cases, but I think it's worth understanding um, how different the use cases for this can be. Again, you really need to have highly sensitive data and or a highly sensitive algorithm. Um, so Microsoft has an incredibly good example of showing over uh, a year's worth of transactions that have been moved on to confidential computing, worked smoothly. Um, there, is a, there are a couple of uh, research institutions which are fully moving over to CC because they have uh, sensitive, uh, particularly like pharmacy and medical data. Um, and then I think, again, we should uh, come back to this point about something that really is close to my heart, being able to work on uh, hard problems with massive amounts of data that we could not touch without doing more harm before. And now we can solve problems without ever having to disclose that data, thanks to the hard thinking of confidential computing. So CC, confidential computing, it's not a could be open source technology. And I hope that I have convinced you today that it is a must be open source technology. If we are serious about a measured, attestable definition of trust, And with that, I think we are done. Um, Hillary, you have to know. Anyone, anyone have any uh, any questions? We've got through a whole bunch of things in somewhat different realms, uh, and I know that's complex, and I apologise, but we'd love to take any questions you might have. Please. Oh, it was the perfect um, presentation. Yeah. There are no <laughs> questions to be had. No, no. Please. Did you have one? No. Oh. Sir. So I, I'm going to take issue with two of the, the, the uh, premises in that, because I like taking issues with premises and statements. Um, the first one is uh, I would say there is no secure, but I know what you mean. That you want that's something which is as secure as possible. Uh, I, I always worry about using the word secure or unqualified. But when you're doing security engineering, we're saying, uh, yeah. So, uh, and you say you often don't want people to know how it's built. I think generally that's exactly the opposite. On the whole, you do want to uh, make it entirely clear and have as much open as possible. Open security is generally uh, considered the, the best way of doing things. And the, the classic example is, uh, is cryptographic primitives, right? You want everyone to know how the protocols work, and then you keep the keys safe. Um, so generally, you want to be exposing how these things work and proving the attestation steps work. And we have people working on formal proofs of some of these as well. So there's a particular guy called uh, Osama who's doing a lot of work on this and, and his, his group around that. Um, currently, not all of this stuff is open source. I mean, Intel keeps most of its stuff closed source, for instance, right? But the RISC-V stuff is. Um, ARM, I think, is, uh, has open sourced all of its firmware that's associated with this. So generally, the more people looking at it, now, I don't always subscribe to um, open source is safe because you've got enough eyes, because there need to be the right eyes, and they need to be incentivized, preferably paid, to look at it. Um, but if it's not open, nobody can look at it, and you can't be sure. So generally, you want to expose it as much as possible and make sure that the ways that the uh, security is provided allow you to have security but have the so that each instance can be secure but the architecture itself is open and known so generally uh, i would absolutely contend and have done for for quite a few years including my, my blog i felt very old i haven't been doing a blog for 10 years but i have been in the field for 25 years so thanks sal for that um but you know i i, I think that open source and having security in the open is generally the best way of doing it please It's really, really difficult. I've got a blog specifically on logging and debugging, so I just spent far too much time in this space. If you're interested, uh, it's on the Confidential Computing. It's confidentialcomputing.io website uh, on the blog. It's very, very tricky. And um, 
how you how you build that in in ways that allow you to maintain appropriate levels of privacy and uh, is is tricky um, and you don't want to kind of like a hardware equivalent of a JTAG where you just plug it in and everything comes out because as soon as you've got that you've lost it. Um, it yes, so the answer is her huh. um, and I'd love to have a conversation about that if it's something you're interested in because it's, it's very, very tricky. It's very easy to leak information and there are things like, you know, there's there are side channel attacks that we need to watch out for, uh, some of which are protected against, some which aren't, some which you can protect against by doing things like having constant time crypto implementations in the TE. How many of the crypto implementations people are using in TEs are constant time? Very few at the moment. Do we need to do that? Yes, we do. So these are exactly the sort of conversations that we need to have. And this, you know, if someone has a constant time crypto implementation they'd like to have as part of the CC, I would love to talk about that, for instance. So I will just keep talking. I, that's, <laughs> sorry. Anyone else? Come on, Hillary. Sorry, no, I've, I've been teasing Hillary because I know Hillary from before. Uh, well, go on then. Thank you. I'll ask on the uh, topic of the side channel. I yeah. read that the, a company that was accused, threat model I believe they, they call it from uh, Carlos and Elena, AMD and, and, and Intel, talked about side channels as being in scope and side channels need to be stopped, which I think logically doesn't make sense for, for trust execution environment. I've also seen on the technical papers for, for SMP on AMD side, for example, that Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, partly it's down to the chip provider, the vendor, to decide what they think is in scope and what is out of scope. Um, there are ways you can protect against some of these. Um, you know, you, the, the example you gave of, of buffers, there may be ways that you can protect by, by your, your low-level computing model. Um, uh, so, for instance, I was uh, co-founder of a project called Enarx, and although not specifically that uh, issue, we wrote our own syscalls, right? So it was all right at the bottom layer, so we could decide what was going out and what's coming in and in what order and those sorts of things. Um, I say we, I didn't write any of that stuff. They don't let me code anymore, but that's fine. <laughs> I'll just be honest. Um, and it's in Rust, of course, because, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, but in terms of the side channels, A, some, are, some will probably always be in scope, uh, in terms of the protection, and some will always be out of scope. But you can also think about things like how your life cycle works. So let's say um, that we're going to think of TEs as providing a good level of granularity for things like containers. Now, putting containers in TEs has some interesting questions, but let's say it's basically a microservice type thing, right? In order to implement a side channel, you're going to need to know a number of things. Firstly, exactly what is in that TE, probably down to the bit level, so exactly what the workload is. You're probably going to need to have a fair amount of time as a privileged process on the same machine as that, possibly the same core as that. And those are things you can fix, right? If you're deploying stuff as a microservice, oh, and you also may need physical access to that box. Right, okay. As a microservice, if you're deploying microservices out in the cloud, I can say none of my processes work for more than 12 hours. I can absolutely be careful about how I uh, obfuscate which workloads go to where, and I can make change if I really care at the bit level to, to provide some of that obfuscation. Um, and so there, and also, you know, hopefully people can't have physical access to the box for a long time. So that doesn't fix all of the problems and it doesn't fit all of the uh, deployment types. But if you start thinking like this, there are ways you can protect yourself against some of these things. And when it comes down to it, there is no perfect security and confidential computing is about raising the bar. 
and knowing what properties you want and how well they can be provided and what assurance levels you can get. And if, it, if, if you can raise the bar and say, well, this just means that we don't need to worry about this level of attack from these sorts of things, great. If it needs to be an HSM at FIPS level 4, well, it should be an HSM if it's FIPS level 4, and that's fine. But it, exactly the right question to be asking, and this is why we need to have this conversation. Did you have a question, sir? And Yeah, yeah. The Z, the Z series, as I think. Yeah. Same thing, yes. So you do a ton of what you're talking about. I'm not saying it's perfect. No. I won't endorse it. No, nothing's perfect. But it'd be, I, it seems like it'd be cool to have some means of scoring top down from and, and this, Raspberry Pis to mainframes. Who does what and, and who's capable of doing it? Yeah. So I, I, I think, firstly, that I wouldn't want to go all the way because we, we need to pick, pick a slice. But there is a literally a, a current conversation in the CCC of which IBM, Red Hat IBM is a member, uh, Emily Fox and Rachel Wan are the right people to speak to from your organization, about whether the CCC should be a, an accreditation slash certification body to say, uh, well, a, at the chip level, AMD say that SEV SNP should fit this, should, uh, should they get a tick? And then at the framework level, the uh, certifier framework, which is one of open source projects, says it does these things. Should we give it this? Uh, at the libOS or at the application level. So uh, it's a very big pie to decide where we want to sit. But it's. It, yeah. 100%. And of course, there's legal recourse if you're not careful, right? So, but this is a conversation we are having, and I'm glad you brought it up because I want to make people think about it as well. And as exec director, I have to, um, well, I'm allowed to express an opinion, but I have to sort of uh, negotiate these conversations as well. And I do have opinions on most things. That's how I'll know. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else? Of course, Enarx, E N A R X, Enarx.dev. It's, uh, it's quiescent at the moment, but uh, if you'd like to have a look, we'd love to have your input. Okay, I'm, I'm just curious more than anything. Of course, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. And Rust is a lovely language. I did learn Rust and write some code, but just nothing that ever got oh, committed. Rusty, oh, yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, Hilary, thank you. What have you got for me? Or oh, for Sal? Yeah, well, I will say uh, hospitals and research hospitals are wildly different. Um, so when, uh, so I, I would have to say I'd limit my experience and also the strongest interaction that we'll see in this space right now is from your grant research institutions because they are required to disclose their data whenever possible. That's putting us in this condition of having the potentiality of supposedly disparate databases, but if they all came from NIH, uh, it's very easy to reconstruct those. So, and, um, but uh, I think uh, as an ongoing discussion, I think there just has to be a clear understanding. So I think privacy in general is emerging. Understanding of, and, and this is very much my perspective, but an understanding of what data points can be issues for privacy. There are uh, things that we thought you could never re-identify that we find out are just as accurate as fingerprints that we are trying to now remove off of data sets, right? Um, that have just been sitting out there on the web. Um, but I think in confidential computing, right, typically it's a known sensitivity. And all I'm saying is that perhaps that bar, perhaps that 
line between what should be confidentially computed or is considered sensitive needs to shift and grow as we understand that sensitivity is relative to other databases. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I think everyone has sensitive data, and some are more aware of it than others. And the healthcare world is becoming more and more aware of it. And if we can say to them, there are models of keeping, having assurances about the confidentiality and integrity of your data, there are new ways of doing that which we can help you with. That's a great way to engage. Um, and, and healthcare and pharmaceutical are two of the most obvious and most highly regulated uh, sectors in which this is playing. So yeah, we've got loads of use cases and would love to, love to have a chat with them, please. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Good. Thank you very much indeed for all your questions and your attention and your time. Much appreciated. If you have any questions, please find Sal or me around or go to confidentialcomputing.io. We'll see you there. Thank you.